The watch you should buy is the one that you can afford and like. It's almost as simple as that. But if you're getting ready to put down a not insignificant amount of cash, and if you're anything like me, you'll want to know if you're getting value for money, if you're getting quality. And that means you need to know a little bit about what's under the hood of the watch, so to speak. In this video, I've put together a beginner's guide to what drives price and quality on a watch by talking a little bit about movements, complications, specifications, materials, dials, cases, finishing, and also help you cut through the marketing hype. You won't leave this video being an expert on movements, but you will have a starting point to make a more informed decision about your next watch purchase. This video is a little bit longer than most because there's a lot to talk about. So I put the chapters into the description so you can skip to the part you want to learn about whenever you feel like it. Also, once I've been through the technical piece, I've also got a real life example of how to use this guide in a practical setting. If you like my videos, like and subscribe, it helps out a lot. With that said, let's get into it. First up is the movement, which basically is the engine of the watch. To start with, you have an initial differentiator of price, which is whether it's a quartz or a mechanical. Quartz is generally the cheapest. In the simplest of terms, quartz is a battery powered and in some ways a newer and more superior technology where mechanical is the oldest technology. But paradoxically, the mechanical movements are typically more expensive to manufacture. There are more parts, there's more machining involved, and there's also often the option to finish the movement, which is the act of embellishing the watch. With few exceptions, mechanical movements will typically be more expensive than their quartz counterparts. And for this video, we'll stick with the mechanical watches. For mechanical watches, you'll want to know if it's a sourced movement or an in-house movement, meaning produced by the manufacturer itself. Third party movements or sourced movements will largely fall into two categories. One where the seller does not tell you anything about the movement and the ones where they state the movement manufacturer. More often than not, because movements are part of the marketing that goes into the watch, you can usually assume that if they don't mention who made the movement, it's probably going to be a cheaper watch. Once you start seeing names like Sedita, Eta, Valju, and Miota, you're moving into reputable mass producers of generally decent movements. Moving up from there, you get into in-house, which is a fraud marketing term. It's supposed to indicate that this means that the manufacturer of the watch, i.e. Rolex, has produced the movement themselves. You need to be aware of several things in general, though. In-house is a branding term that companies use to drive up price. It's like free range or farm fresh or ethically sourced, all terms that may or may not mean something. But we as consumers sometimes blindly pay more without knowing what these terms actually mean. In-house is also not a protected term. For some, this means that they have designed, produced, and assembled the entire movement. For others, this can mean that they have sourced a third-party movement and modified it in some way. Also, as many watch brands are owned by conglomerates, there is a lot of sharing among brands which muddies the term in-house further. In-house does also not necessarily mean that the movement is better than a sourced movement. This depends on the standards of the manufacturer, their experience with building movements, and a whole lot more. The good thing to know is that the internet has your back. Almost all producers that state specs on their watches will disclose the movement model number. Google it and you can quickly find out how in-house it actually is and also what the watch community thinks about this specific movement. Generally though, you'll want to check at minimum the specifications of the movement, the accuracy of the watch. So how much time it gains or loses per day. Plus minus two is very good. Plus minus 10 is below average. The power reserve. 36 hours should be a minimum. 70 hours is, I think, becoming industry standard by now. Related to this, checking Swiss watches specifically for COSC or Meta certifications, which among other things guarantees that accuracy has been tested. If you're dealing with a highly finished movement, you're either in the category of machine finishing or hand finishing. Hand finishing is by far the most expensive and labor intensive. Only brands that produce relatively few watches do this, and the price is very much aligned with this. Complications are what the watch can do. At a minimum, it can tell the hours and the minutes. From there, the price goes up as more complications get added in total. One to date, price goes up. One to day, price goes up. Chronograph, price goes up. Complications like perpetual calendars, moon phases, chiming mechanisms are the most expensive and bar a few exceptions, you don't see them from mass market watch manufacturers. The price goes up because the complication is an addition to the base movement in some way. It's the turbocharger on the main engine, the AMG or M-Class to the standard base engines of the Merck and BMW. 
Not unsurprisingly, price goes up dependent on the materials used in the watch manufacturer. Plastic is cheap. Steel will be the next step up, but can vary wildly depending on the way steel has to be shaped. From there, you go to specialized materials like ceramics, titanium, silver, and bronze, all of which drive up the price. Finally, you get into full precious metal models at the highest price points, which is reasonable enough, except be aware that you pay a significant premium for a rare and precious metal that is massively disproportionate compared to the actual relative cost of the precious metal on its own compared to steel. There's a huge markup for non-steel metals or alloys. I mentioned that steel can vary wildly in price. There are a lot of factors that go into this, but the first thing to be aware of is whether a watch is stamped or milled. The simplest of methods is stamping with a large machine a relative thin piece of metal into the desired shape. Milling, broadly speaking, takes a big chunk of steel and cuts the solid block into the desired shape. The quality turns out better overall, giving a more substantial and solid construction. This goes for both case and bracelet. The more intricate the milling and subsequent polishing and finishing, the higher the price. When the details are done by hand, the price skyrockets. It takes experience to notice the differences, but beveled edges, chamfers, all of those kind of things add to the price, as do sandblasting, polishing, and if you have combinations of multiple techniques on a case, the price will go up. What goes for the case goes for the bracelet too in regards to price. The thing about a bracelet is that it has moving parts like a car door. You can do the car door shutting test or something similar. So what does the bracelet sound like when you rattle it? What is the lateral flexibility of the bracelet? Is it rigid or not? Is the bracelet clasp stamped or milled? How well is it polished or brushed for that matter? Or are there contrasting components of polishing and or brushing? If it's leather, is it real leather or is it pleather? Then there are the functional characteristics that also drive up the price. Folding or security mechanisms, intricacy of the bracelet links, are there micro adjustments in the clasp or even an on the fly extender often found in dive watches. As soon as the dial becomes textured in some way, sunray, guilloche, clou de Paris, up goes the price. As soon as markers are applied and not just painted on, up goes the price. When there is blued steel or use of precious metals in the dial, ceramic dials, textured dials and so on, the price goes up. The best thing to do is look at the dial and ask. You can often tell. Experts may go down with a microscope and find blemishes on a Rolex seconds hand that you would not find on a Patek Nautilus, but for most of us we won't see the differences on everything on the dial. You will, however, when holding a Rolex next to a Tudor, see that the dial is usually a few steps above what the Tudor can do. Plastic, hard lakes, acrylics are cheap. Sapphire is typically premium. Whether there's an anti-reflective coating is to some extent a cost driver, but not entirely because anti-reflective properties sometimes change the characteristics of the dial colors, and therefore some manufacturers do it, don't do it, or do it on one side or both. Domed or flat is more an aesthetic consideration than anything else. A display case back will drive up the price. One, because it's harder to achieve similar water resistance as a steel back, but also because they likely want you to marvel at the beautiful movement, even when it isn't always beautiful. Sometimes you'll find cheaper watches with third party standard movements where they have a display case back. I, I've never really seen the point, especially automatics where the rotor basically covers the entire movement. And then there's marketing. This is where it gets complicated. The thing about this category is that there is potentially extreme price on for moving up in the categories without necessarily getting a much better watch. And the watch manufacturers know this. It can be very hard to navigate this space, but I've decided to categorize watches and their manufacturers in the following categories. Fashion accessory, marketing, storytelling, and heritage. The fashion accessory watches are the MVM team watches of the world. They do not pretend to have a deep backstory. They make cheap watches and make them in designs that sell. Some even make money by producing cheap knockoffs of higher end brand designs. The way you identify them is that they have no story of any kind. It's just pick a watch you like and move on. Moving up the scale, you get to brands that have invented a story. This is not a bad thing. And if they're around in 50 years time, their marketing may become heritage. But the key here is that they are trying to demonstrate that they are in a niche, be it the, we wanted to make beautiful watches affordable for regular people, or we only use recycled materials, or my own personal favorite, uh, we've cut out the middleman. They are commanding a small premium for whatever story they have concocted. It's not 
just new brands that do this, but you can usually tell if you spend a couple of minutes on their site to figure out how deep their marketing actually goes. Moving up a notch, we get to the storytellers where a lot of the mid and high end brands lie. The line between marketing, storytelling and heritage are fine ones. The Omega Moonwatch is a good illustration of this. The Moonwatch has heritage. It's been to the moon and back. There's some clear heritage there, but Omega sometimes tries its absolute best to leverage that heritage way beyond what is reasonable. And that's where something like the Moon Swatch comes in. It's storytelling more than heritage, albeit for Swatch and not for Omega directly. Omega does this often, mixing storytelling, marketing and heritage. The James Bond watches will for some lie in pure marketing, where others will view it as strong to storytelling or even heritage. Omega would definitely have you believe that it's storytelling because that's what they feel justifies a premium price. At the high end, you have heritage marketing. I think the best way to describe their branding is a marketing approach that essentially communicates we're the best, we've been around for ages, and you have to ask permission to buy our watches as a consequence. This is Patek, Lange, AP, and those kind of watches. Let's put this into action. I've chosen four watches, the Lego Flieger Chrono, the Aorus Pro Pilot, the IWC Pilot Chrono, and the Patek Pilot Travel Time. Let's start with the Leica and the IWC. Starting with the movement, it's the same movement in both watches. IWC has newer models where they have actual fully in-house movements, but in this specific model, it is granted a modified movement that they've made some changes to, but overall, it's the same sourced movement in both models. The materials of the case are the same, and if you look long and hard, you can probably see that in some areas, the IWC is finished to a better level than the Leiko. But you know, to be perfectly honest, yes, that's going to command a higher price, but there's also an aesthetic consideration and some people will actually like the Leiko more. So where's the price difference? Marketing. IWC has the storytelling, where Leiko is has some heritage, but they don't push us out. Their brand can't, can't, just does not command the same price or they choose not to command it. Then we bring in the Patek. The Patek is a completely different kettle of fish. It's a fully gold case that's going to drive up the price. It's a highly finished movement that's going to drive up the price. It's got complications because it's got day and date and uh, night and GMT kind of functions. I forget what it's called. Um, that's also going to drive up the price. Technically, some of the features of the actual movement are not as good as the IWC and the Leica, you know, power reserve and stuff like that. Overall, though, when you look at the materials used, the finishing levels, this watch is going to command a higher price, and that's perfectly reasonable. How much more reasonable? That's a good question, but it, it, it's not unfair that it's going to cost more than the IWC and the Leica. Then there's the Oris. Now, aesthetically, it's a completely different watch. But look at the technical characteristics. It's a fully in-house movement with significantly better power reserve, with significantly better finishing. You've got a titanium case, which, like I said, drives up the price. You've got a fully skeletonized dial. This watch is amazing. And it completely knocks it out of the park. If you like the IWC, cool, because it's a very pretty watch and they do not look the same. And if you like one and you don't like the other, it's not going to matter to you that the one is titanium and skeletonized and fully finished and has a better, better movement. But if you're interested in value for money, the most value for money in this pick is the Oris. And there's also a very strong case for the Leiko as well. I chose these four watches on purpose. They're all pilot watches, but they represent an interesting case study. The Patek isn't technically the best movement wise based on functional requirements, but the materials, the complication, the heritage of Pateks and the finishing on the case and movement overall justify a very high price premium. The specific IWC model though is really in trouble here. You've got a Leiko, which for many people will look identical, will have a very similar movement and only marginally worse finishing. I really like the IWC, but in this specific model, it's probably not a great value proposition. And then you've got the ProPilot. This watch is technically, materially and finishing wise a million miles ahead of the IWC and costs only slightly more. Overall, my advice is always that you should always buy a watch that you like and will wear. Knowing what's under the hood doesn't hurt. Knowing that you can't necessarily assume that better brands 
by default give you better value or significantly better quality. Knowing where you are getting value and where you're getting a dose of marketing will be a relevant consideration for many. There's nothing wrong with paying a premium for a watch or a brand if that watch or brand or value proposition speaks to you. Go ahead and do it. Just be informed. Hopefully this video helps newcomers to the watch world. If you like my content, please be sure to come back another time. I really appreciate the feedback I get from you guys. So comment below if you like these kind of videos. If you want other com uh, content, let me know as well. And, you know, see you next time. Thanks.